Good morning, Cedar Springs. We, happy first Sunday of April. If you guys want to make, make your ways to your seat. If you found somebody you'd rather hang out with while you're standing up, feel free to sit with them. Um, it's just as long as you find a seat. That would be phenomenal. How you guys doing? That might have been a record right there. Or at least a record of uh, how the room just quieted down. Oh, it's amazing. I'm, I'm Joe Crocker. I'm one of the elders, and I get the privilege to be able to speak today. But before we do, I have some announcements I would like to share. And before I share announcements, I, I just want to thank you if this is your first time attending here in the building or at home online. We just want to welcome you, and we're thankful that you're here. If you haven't already, you can get a first-time guest uh, uh, gift out in the, the lobby, as well as we have a, an app. It's our own Cedar Springs Community Church app, and if you want to be able to connect to that app, you can scan the QR code on the Connect card in the seat back in front of you, or you could go to the Connect booth afterwards, and they'll direct you in what to do. Um, it has all of the information about what's going, the uh, monthly happenings, the weekly happenings, our community groups, um, what's coming up in midweek. The midweek classes will be on there this coming week, um, and you can register for events and all the other things that need to happen. Uh, today, right after the service, we are having starting point. It'll be in the classroom right out to the right, and then you turn left, or it'll be your left and then right. Um, just the room over there, okay? It doesn't make any sense. Um, that's why I use Google Maps. Okay. And so if you've been coming for a few weeks and you want to get to know more about who we are as a church, um, it'd be great to, there's some light refreshments in there. It'd be great to, what is going on? There's like a, is that going to throw you off, Sue? Okay. All right. Um, light refreshments and just, uh, maybe it'll be like a 15 minute conversation. And then tonight as well, 5 p.m. is adulting. It's at Jordan and Megan's house. So if you're a young adult, 18 to 30-ish, uh, feel free to go. It's been a, a, a they, they do a great job. There's fun games, amazing food. And so if you need to know how to get there, you could go talk to one of those two afterwards. If you're a young adult, invite your young adult friends to come. You can sign up on the app, I believe, as well. And then th we have some exciting news on April 14th, which is next Sunday. We are doing baptisms here at Cedar Springs. Yeah, so we're going to, we're, ex we're expecting to see, I already know there's a few people that are like, I'm, I'm going to get baptized, I'm going to get re-baptized. One of them, we told them we're going to hold them on longer, under longer. Um, but so if you are considering baptism and you want to even know more about what that would look like for you, you could reach out to us after the service, me or one of the elders, and we would walk you through that. We'd love to see you guys get baptized next week. Man, there's a lot of uh, alarms going off. Um, this April 21st is our core joint class. It's the first class of our membership series. So if you've been coming for a while and you're like, I want to become a member of Cedar Springs, this is where you start. You join, you go to the join class, you get some information on who we are and you're like, I want to align myself with Cedar Springs. And then we move forward from there. It'll be next week during the, right after the worship time. Okay. And we have so many announcements. We have two more. Two more. I'm going to invite Chris to come up, and I'll share it. Chris is going to come up. We're going to uh, talk about midweek. We have a couple, mid, three midweek classes. Yeah, I got a mic right here. Um, this week, coming up, and Chris is going to share his first. Okay. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm Chris. Uh, we, are, we are starting midweek this Thursday, and the class that I'll be teaching is Second Timothy. And Second Timothy is one of my favorite books. Out of the 66, um, they're all about pretty equally favorite. But anyway, um, what would you say to someone if you knew you'd never see them again and you might perhaps never see anybody else again? This is what Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy. He wrote his most important instructions, the things that would be most applicable to Timothy's life, the things that would be most important for the church, he wrote the things that were dearest to his heart, and he, he wanted to get them embedded in Timothy so that he would never forget, and he would always have this kind of a fatherly uh, advice to 
move his life forward on and to guide him through his life in ministry. And so we're going to be taking um, uh, the next seven weeks and going through the book of 2 Timothy, um, the last writings of Paul that we know of, yeah. and it should be really a good study. So if you want to be involved with that, come on in. Thanks, Chris. Okay, I have, I'm going to announce one of the classes, Albie, he's in Sunday school right now, he's one of our teachers, and he's also teaching a midweek class on Galatians, a, a study through Galatians, he is continuing the study that he's already have been, was doing over the winter quarter, but he said anybody can just jump right in, so you guys can register for that this coming week, we'll send out a, a push notification or an email for you to know when you can sign up. And I'm going to be leading a class as well, and it's on how to be unsuccessful. All right? How we can be unsuccessful in our lives, but become successful in our following of Jesus and our walk in, with Christ and find true success in him. It's a, it's a seven-week or six-week video series. There'll be a, a week where we have discussion over it, so I'm really excited for that. It's really well done. So if you want to join that class, feel free. Great to have you. Okay, one more announcement. Oh my goodness, man, why do we have so many announcements? Thank you, Lord, that we have a lot of things going on here at the church. This is my favorite one, though. It's spaghetti extravaganza. Yeah. The team has decided that we are going to call this a forest fairy tale. So you can come dressed up like you're living in the forest, or you could come dressed up very elegant. I would prefer that you just dressed up like you're going out on a great night out with your spouse or with your friends. Um, this, if this is your, uh, you haven't heard about Spaghetti Extravaganza, it's our once a year annual youth fundraiser, and we serve spaghetti and salad and great dessert and whatever else that our amazing chef Megan makes. Um, for, what's the cost? Wow, $20 an individual, $35 a couple, and all of the proceeds go to support the, the youth budget throughout the year and to support students to go to the summer camp. Summer camp's costs, we haven't figured it out yet. We're trying to figure out how we can lower, lower it on our, on our end because it's rather expensive this year. And so, yeah, we want you to come and enjoy the night. There will be a dessert auction my wife will be reaching out to some of you in the next week or so to ask if you would make a beautiful dessert for the auction to be auctioned off um, for a very high price, as well as um, have a smaller dessert table for cash donations. Tickets are on sale right now. You can sign up on the app, as well as there are some teens in here coming around and saying, hey, do you want to come to this event? If they don't pitch it really well, go to a different teen and buy the tickets. <laughs> The team that sells the most tickets gets their camp paid for. So we wanted to incentivize students to be a little bit more, you know, advantageous in selling tickets. If, they, if your grandma lives across the country and she's like, I want to support the youth group, feel free to ask her. She may not come, but she can help support the youth group. We're excited for what God is doing in our teenagers' lives. We're excited for all that he's doing, and this is a great way for us as the church to rally around them and support them financially. Woo! All right. Praise the Lord. We're in our, uh, we just finished our series on prayer, but now we're, we're moving into a, a new series that we're calling Heaven Intercedes, and the series is going to be on Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17. Um, and so today I'm going to do the introduction. I'm going to try to do the best that I can to set the stage of some of the events, some of the things that were happening in the life of the disciples and of Jesus leading up to this moment of the high priestly prayer in John 17. And then we're going to go through the series leading all the way up to the end of May. Thank you, Father, for today. Thank you uh, for this church. Thank you for the, our the, your, our lives that you've given us. Holy Spirit, would you just open our hearts for what you would speak to us today and share with us today. Give me the words to speak. It's your, it's your church. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I know some of you are like kind of looking around. When are we going to do communion? We're going to do it at the end, okay? 
So if you're like, man, they said we were doing communion. Am I going to do this on my own? No, we'll do it at the end as a church. So uh, I just, if we can just visualize for a moment, just put yourself back. We just celebrated Easter, and the highest priestly prayer took place the, the night before Jesus was brought to the cross. The night before, it was a, a Thursday night, the night before Jesus was arrested. And just imagine that you knew that your last days, Jordan actually alluded to this a little bit, that your last days were coming, that you knew like the day you're going to die. This is really dark, I know. That you knew that, that the end was near, that you knew that your death was imminent. How would you react in that moment? How would you respond in that moment? For most of us, we would say, well, I would do this, I would do that, I would do that, until we're actually in that moment. For some of us, we would just go and be like, well, it looks like I'm going to pass away in a year from now. I know the date, so I'm just going to quit my job and I'm going to enjoy my life. For others, we, we would know maybe it's sooner, like Jesus, and we would begin to impart everything that we knew, everything that we had, every plan that I had in place for, for my family and my friends. We'd begin to lay out all the foundation. Some of us, we would go on vacations. We'd spend every dollar we had in our bank account, maybe rack up a bunch of debt as well, right? Some of us might go skydiving finally. We might live a little bit more risky. Some of us might proclaim who Jesus is, saying the time is short. And some of us might just proclaim that death is imminent and woe is me, woe is me, look at me, look at me. I think many of us, though, would want to share the things that we know we need to share before we go. Like, I'm experiencing that with my father right now. He's kind of in and out, in and out. He's going in and out of these hospital visits. And every time I go to talk with him, it's like, oh, I'm sorry I did this. I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry I did that. And I'm like, why is that even, why is that even an issue for you? But it's always where we, we, I think at the end of our time, there are these moments we really want to make sure that everything is done. And I believe that's what happened here in John uh, 13 through 17. I'm going to go right up to uh, chapter 17, and this is taking place, this, this entire time is taking place in what Jesus called, and in the times in Jerusalem, they have these beautiful hospitality places, these beautiful places for parties and large gatherings called the upper room. And he sat in the upper room, knowing that he was going to be arrested and put on trial and sat and, and sent to Calvary and go to Calvary. And he sat in the room with his disciples and he took the moment, every moment that he had, to pour out every thought and every piece of advice, every lesson and every prayer that he could do. He didn't miss a thing. Jesus was perfect Everything that he knew that needed to be said in those moments was said. His final instructions and investments into the men that he gave would ultimately use them to change the very course of the world. <clears throat> what Jesus did and said in the upper room should help us understand why he did what he did. And so the Apostle John in the book of John gives us this great perspective on what took place leading up to the high priestly prayer. He opens the door for us, so to speak, to the upper room. And for us to see how Jesus prepared his disciples for his death and how all of his disciples began to prepare their hearts as well. Right? We prepare our hearts when a loved one is on their deathbed as well as we prepare our hearts when um, I believe we would prepare our hearts when we're on our own deathbed. But before I go any further, I would like to show a picture of upper room in Jerusalem. Some say this is where Jesus met the disciples. What? You forgot to put the picture? Okay. I love you, Ronnie. Okay. Don't Google it. Just pull it up on... Oh. 
This is really awkward. Okay. There you go. We're going to get into that. <laughs> you could take it off, though. But yeah, you can see the pillars and the stairways. It, it, Jesus said he wanted a place that was furnished, a place where they can have a meal and get together. And John gives the different perspective of Jesus' life. And in the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they give details around the specific events. They, they share parables in John. They, he talks about Jesus more and about who he is and what he's doing. Jesus described in different metaphors in the book of John. And John focused specifically on Jesus as Messiah and as the Son of God. So to speak, in John 3.16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son to down from heaven to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And another reminder for us is Jesus is saying, Listen here, truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. And he said to them, you are from below. He's, he's telling the disciples, I am from above. You are of this world. He's telling the religious leaders, actually. But I am not of this world. See, John is painting this picture that Jesus is the Son of God. He is God in flesh. That he's, he has come down from heaven to rescue us from our sins. But Jesus is coming into this moment of the upper room with giving us a different perspective. This book was written likely in uh, around 70 to 100 A.D. And it was written to the Jews first, but also to Gentiles, which are non-Jews, a.k.a. us. And in 1 John 38 through 42, just so you know, this is what the Bible would say, Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him for the day. For it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looks at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So to, be, to get another better understanding, I think it would be helpful to see some of the cultural factors that were happening in this time leading up to Jesus' high priestly prayer. We learn in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that Jesus asked Peter and John to prepare a Passover meal by finding a large furnished upper room that we just saw on Google. Jesus knew where this upper room was. And so the day of the unleavened bread took place during the Passover. And the Passover is the time when many Jewish people remembered God rescuing them out of Egypt. And we could read that story in Exodus 12. But as a part of Passover, the Jews would sacrifice an unblemished lamb or goat to cover their sins. It was this ritualistic thing that they had to do. They had to slaughter it in a certain way and cover their sins. And this was a, a, a yearly thing that they did. And as the Passover was being prepared in the upper room, Jesus knew that he would be the final lamb to be sacrificed. Not just any lamb, though, but perfect pure, and a sinless lamb. 
And here's what John the Baptist proclaims about Jesus at the beginning of the book of John. He says in John 1, 29, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus also knew that the religious leaders wanted him dead. They're, he's sending his disciples to go find a place to have a meal. I know that there are all of these people that are clamoring to find me and to kill me. But before that happens, we're going to have a meal and we're going to wash. I'm going to wash your feet and I'm going to pray with you and we're going to do some amazing things together. Jesus didn't run and hide. Jesus didn't cower back. Jesus didn't say, why are they chasing me? He didn't complain. He said, this is the plan that God has for me. See, the religious leaders didn't want their lives to change, their mode of operation, the the power that they had over people. They didn't want to lose that power. They didn't want um, their people to start following Jesus. Jesus, the Messiah, they wanted them to look at them. So this leads us to the Thursday morning before Jesus was arrested. And the disciples, the first, my first point is this, the disciples came to Jesus on the first day of unleavened bread to inquire about a Passover preparation. In Luke 22, 7 through 13, then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there, he says. And they went and found it just as he told them, and they prepared the Passover. You see, Jesus gives them this this picture, this prophetic word. They're like, well, you're sending us into the city. Like, I don't even, what am I even going to be looking for? No, there's going to be this guy with a jar of water. And you're, so you could just imagine being those two guys, and you see this guy with a jar of water, and you're like, oh my goodness, how did he even know that? And so they go into the room. And then point two is Jesus and his disciples celebrated the Passover. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, says he loved them to the end. During supper... When the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, poor soul, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. So he knows in this moment that Judas is about to betray him. Which is to me is like another question of like, just his pure love. Another thought of like who he just, Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew that he was God in the flesh. He knew that he was the son of God and he knew that he had a mission to complete. And there was nothing that was going to stop him and he wasn't going to stop loving anyone in his path. So he takes his robe off, his, this towel, and he wraps it around his waist. And, he, and many of us have heard this, but we're going to get into it. Then it goes... And this is all happening in the upper room that washed the feet of his disciples. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter and said to them, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What am I doing? You do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Jesus said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if you do not wash, if I do not wash, you have no share with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except 
for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. Which leads to the next stage. Jesus explained the washing of the feet in humble service. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garment and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have, you, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who has sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. You see, Jesus is saying, I am the the servant of all. I came not to be served, but to serve. And as if that's who we are trying to emulate, then we are the ones that need to be the ones serving and not being served. Whether it's washing feet, whether it's fill, fill in the blank, whether it's putting the chairs out, whether, whether it's out in the community, there's things in our lives that we're like, oh, no, just serve me. How about you just feed me some grapes, right? But Jesus is setting this example for us, is that no, for us to honor him, us to glorify him, us for people to see who he is in us, we have to be the ones that are laying our lives down for others. Washing feet is a nasty business. You don't hear many uh, businesses around Graham saying, I'm a foot washer. But it might not be, seem like a big deal to you, but I've never thought about it from this perspective as much as I should have. We know that Jesus was aware of the fact that Judas, his, his disciple that he called, that he loves, was about to betray him. His own disciple and the one he even knew which one it was going to be, right? But how could he proceed to wash the man's feet that was going to betray him? I think many of us in this room, if we knew that someone was going to betray us, we would just X them out of our lives immediately. We'd, We'd go... In the other, we go the other direction. We, we, we would maybe try to talk them off the ledge. We'd be like, please don't do that, please don't do that, right? But we definitely wouldn't be washing their feet. They're like, no, I'll wash everyone else's feet, but you're, you're, you're bad news. Ah, why would he do this? I believe it's to teach us a lesson and them a lesson on his unfailing and unwavering love. I would submit that he did it for a very good reason. Jesus is love personified, right? Love incarnate, God in the flesh. He is what love looks like, alive and breathing. This is not love as we see it today, that is fleeting, that is temporal, that is momentary. It is it's not the love that we see in marriages that last a, a year or two and, and people fall out of love because somebody said something wrong or did something wrong. Through this example, Jesus shows us that even our enemies are deserving of love. Not just through our prayers, but through our actions. We can't say, I love you in our minds and then not act on it. We can't say uh, to your girlfriend that you want to become fiance, I love you, I want to get married to you, will you marry me? And then not act on it and give them a ring. If they do that, they're probably not the right person to get married to. Right? There's an action point. I, I'm, I want to get married to you, so I'm going to purchase something and I'm going to give it to you as a reminder of my love for you. For if we are to call ourselves Christians and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, and we are, are to love our enemies enough to overcome what has ever set ourselves at odds with each other, whether it's 
religion, or politics, or um, fill in the blank. Maybe it's somebody that got a better job than you at work, and you felt that that job was yours. Maybe it's your neighbor that built the fence in the wrong place. You see, Jesus is like, no, I'm going to reach out and I'm going to touch someone, especially their feet. The, the washing of the feet was this intimate moment where you have to love someone, right? You have to be so close with that person and so like knowing that they're okay with this, that we're going to do that. And it's just this true lack of serving and loving. And in 1 John 4, 20, if anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. Whoever does not love a brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. We're talking about brothers that are made in the and sisters that are made in the image of God. Our brothers that maybe are in our family that may not attend church or at work or at school. But it may seem trivial at first, but this when we lay our hands on someone to pray for someone that Jesus did often, it's this act of saying, I love you enough to lay my hand on, on you and pray. And Jesus would do that, and we would see healings happen. We would see Jesus heal people by touching their ears, by touching their eyes, by reaching out to them. John and Peter reached out to the man at the gate. But here's an example of forgiveness. We're going to talk about forgiveness in a few moments for communion. But how many of you have heard of uh, a Dutch woman named Corrie Ten Boom? See, she was uh, a, a young lady during Nazi regime. Am I getting a lot of feedback here? Okay. Nazi regime. She worked as a watchmaker but that was just the cover her family wanted to rescue the Jews from Nazi Germany they got caught and end up getting put into a camp and in this interview she says this it's not on the screen it says Corey Ten Boom recalled her shock when a previous captor approached her and asked her for forgiveness She says, I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. She said, you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. He was saying that he was a guard there and he did not remember her. But since since that time he went on and he said that I had become a Christian And I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Again, his hand came out to her. He says, will you forgive me? She says, I stood there. I whose sins had every day to be forgiven, and I could not. Betsy, her sister, had died in that place. Could he erase her? slow, terrible death simply for asking. She added, I could not have been, it could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But to me, it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing that I've ever had to do. But for I had to do it, I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. And if we do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Still, I stood there with coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. She says, forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. She's praying silently. She says, Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling, she said. So she recalls the following interaction. 
And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the outstretched out to me as I did, and an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder and raced down my arm and sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood from my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. She says, I forgive you, brother. And I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, she says, we grasped each other's hands, the former God guard and the former prisoner, and I'd never known God's love so intensely than I did right then. You see, these, <laughs> all of these things are leading up to this moment of John 17, and Jesus, he loved the unloved. He loved us. The unlovable. We all have people in our lives who we dislike or even despise being around. Or when they come in the room, you're like, oh no. What am I going to do now? Maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm just really a horrible person. There are some people in our lives that we find difficult to love. But yet God requires and calls us to love them. We have decided sometimes not to love them. But that is not the gospel. In washing Judas's feet, Jesus is showing us that we are not to be selective with our love. We have received in abundance the boundless love of God. And so we are to shower that love onto others. We are to go in our pride to someone that we have wronged and say, will you forgive me? Which is actually an attitude of love as well. Will you forgive me the way I handled that situation? All right. In John 13, 18 through 30, Jesus says this. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know who I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled he who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I receive, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. And after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked. At one another. Just like we would be like, well, is it going to be you? Is it going to be you? Not me. It's got to be you. Sorry, I wasn't pointing at you. Okay. <laughs> one of his disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining at a table, at the table at Jesus' side. And so Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. Hey, ask Jesus. So the disciples leaning back against Jesus said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I give the morsel of bread when I have dipped it. Now, I don't know about you, right here in this moment, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to watch who Jesus gives the bread to. And then I'm going to go and talk to that person and try to walk them off the edge. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him, poor guy, and Jesus said to him, what are you going to do? Do it quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why Jesus said this to him. Some thought because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what you need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. Did they not just pay attention? I, I, and as I was reading this and as I was preparing, I really believed like the Holy Spirit was guarding them. He didn't want them to intervene. He was like, no, this is going to happen, and I'm not going to let these knuckleheads screw it up. But he was, Jesus is telling this prophetic word that King David said in Psalms 41.9, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, 
has lifted his heel against me. And when he wrote the psalm, he had been betrayed by a person in whom he had trusted as well. But more than that, though, David was, was also prophesying this messianic uh, prophecy about Jesus. It was under the influence of the Holy Spirit. It had, it had a bigger, a fuller ramification. Jesus said scripture was to be fulfilled in this moment. So now we're at the night. We're at night. So we started in the morning. We're at the night. And in, in, in in point five is Jesus then initiates the Lord's Supper, which we're going to do here in a few moments. So I'm going to go back to that. And then we're going to go to uh, point six. Like many of us, we are wanting to know sometimes who's going to be in first place. Like if your kids are in sports, they're on track, sometimes there's photo finishes. The disciples are having this conversation with Jesus about who's going to be the greatest in heaven. Like in this moment of your uh, teacher, your rabbi that you're following, the one that you love, is talking about that his death is imminent and you're caring more about who's going to be the greatest in heaven. And Jesus, he gives them a good perspective. I think for us, too, as a reminder, when things are going on in our lives, many times we, we're trying to, like, usurp ourselves or put ourselves in different positions instead of listening to what Jesus is saying to us. So a dispute rose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And Jesus says to them, the king of the Gentiles exercised lordship over them, and to who and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as the one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at the table or one who serves? It is not the one who reclines at the table. But I am among you as the one who serves. I think I am the greatest one. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He's saying they're all going to have a job. There's not one of them are greater or lesser. We're all his sons and daughters. We're all, as Christians, if you call Jesus your Lord and Savior, we're all co-heirs with Christ. And then in my seventh point is that he gives his disciples a new commandment. When he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Reminding them just for a little while longer. You will seek me right now in this room, just as I said to the Jews. So now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And then in chapter 17, Jesus goes into a lot of this as well. And he goes into the unity of us as believers, not just as one church, but as the global church, the corporate church, the capital C church. And continually, Jesus pointed not to himself, but to God the Father, and that the glory Jesus would bring is for God alone. So everything that he's pointing to in this, these final moments of his life. He's instructing and teaching us, but he's also pointing back to the Father. All right. Running out of time. And point eight. Jesus taught his disciples on the Holy Spirit. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. He doesn't say that you'll do some of the works, 
Some of you might do them. Some of you might not. But he says, those who believe in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do. Because I am going to the Father, and whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. To be with you, not temporarily, not just for a moment, not just on random occasions, but to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him. For he dwells with you. And you with you and will be in you. And this is his promise to all of us. I will not leave you as orphans. He says, I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And that day you will also know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself in him. There are so many more things we can say that happen in the upper room. That Jesus says, I am the vine. And you are the branch. He says, abide in me, and I'll abide in you. If David can come up, Dave Frolic. He also reminds us that, he says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. And if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. That sounds like so much fun. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him. Who sent me. You see, Jesus doesn't sugarcoat what it looks like to follow him. He's not sugarcoating this moment of time leading up to like the most horrific death imaginable, willingly going to the cross. You see, he gives us this idea, he gives us this message of hope. That he says, I will not leave you, but I will send you a helper. But, but when things are moving and when God is stirring and people come to you and they start persecuting you, which is happening in many places around the world, he says, know that it's not you, but it's because of me. It's a reminder for us to not take offense of that person. Of why do they hate me? Why are they angry with me? They don't hate us. They are angry and they hate Jesus. It's why? Because they, they do not know him who sent me. And one of the crux of John 17 that I love so much is he talks about unity in the church. And Lonnie Arnold's coming in a few weeks and he's going to share on it. But the moment of the church, we have many churches in our area that have different denominations, maybe different stylistic of worship but yet we are all under the banner of Jesus. And if we as people cannot get along as churches, then how are the people in the, our community ever going to even know the one who sent us? So we're going to take communion. As I was processing 
all of the weight. It's unimaginable the weight that Jesus had on him. In this moment, why he's sharing the Last Supper with his disciples. It's also unimaginable that in that moment, he still had forgiveness for Judas. In 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29, it says, Paul is saying that whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. He reminds us, let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning what's in your life will bring judgment upon himself. So can we just take, can we just stand? Mackenzie's, the word that God spoke through Mackenzie today about the inside of the cup, cleaning the inside of the cup and the outside of the cup. But there's this moment for us where maybe there's uh, unforgiveness in your heart. Maybe there's bitterness. Maybe there's things that are dividing between you and God. And yes, there's forgiveness. And yes, there's all of those things, but there's this moment where we can recognize that we need to say, no, we, we have to be able to confess those things to the Lord. So I just want to encourage us right now, we're going to take the next moment, and whatever it might be, that you would just confess that to God. That you just put yourself in right standing, whatever it is. And then we're going to uh, take communion together. Do you have one? So if you want to just say it out loud or quietly, let's just take this moment. forgive us of our trespasses. Would you forgive us of stupid things we've done? Now back to point five. They're here in the upper room in that beautiful place. And it says, now they were eating and Jesus took bread. And it says, after blessing it and broke it and gave it to the disciples, he said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup had one cup and when he had he took a cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink of it all of you for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins I tell you I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's drink together. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you promised us that you'll never leave us. You'll never abandon us. Help us as a people to see and feel and understand just a, a moment of the weight that you experienced in the the final hours of your life. Help us to be a people that will be investing in 
discipling and encouraging and serving and laying our lives down for the benefit of others, to see others come to know you. See, this moment of, we recognize, Lord, this moment of your sacrifice, this moment of laying it all out on the line was to see, for you to see others come to faith in you. That you would conquer death in the grave for us. Help us to not take these words lightly. Help us to not be like, oh, that was okay, let's go home and help us to be a people that are like, wow, Lord, you're so good to us. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross for us. Thank you that you laid it all out on the line, and yet we offer so little, Lord. Help us to see where we can actually really lay our life down for your kingdom. May you be glorified, and thank you for this church. We bless my friends, my family. We love you, Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. We serve a, an amazing king that laid his life down for us. It was by no accident or chance that we are here today. Have a great Sunday.